Native American historian. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'm not a Native American historian and I'm uh, not an archeologist or an anthropologist, but I do love food. That is my entry to uh, many different subjects. And this kind of grew out of a history happy hour I did at Lake Drum Brewing. And the owners were interested in fruits that were used by the Seneca. And they've been coming, uh, incorporating native plants like st staghorn sumac into their ciders. So I took it a step further and began looking at uh, all the various food ways as well. And as I began research, I realized that we need to go back further than just the uh, Seneca Nation to the uh, first documented people in this area. And uh, that was the, the Lamoka people or culture. They, were, uh, they weren't a nation, but this designation was based on uh, similar archeological evidence that was found. And uh, William Ritchie later became the New York State archeologist, but at the time in 1925, he was working for the Rochester Museum of arts and sciences, now uh, uh, science and history. And uh, in 1925, he began excavations at a site uh, on Lamoka Lake. And if you're familiar with the area, uh, Lamoka and Juanita Lakes are right between uh, the southern uh, end of Seneca and Cuca Lakes. And he spent uh, four seasons uh, doing excavating and uh, at the time, he wasn't really sure of the uh, time period, but when carbon dating, carbon dating became available later on, uh, the Lamoka culture was placed in the late Archaic period, uh, about 2500 BC. And um, the evidence was uh, for their uh, food patterns. They were hunter gatherers. They were not uh, raising crops like the later cultures. Um, they didn't appear to have uh, long settlements. They uh, maybe stayed for a year and then moved on. And I will go back quickly. So uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, most concentration of uh, people from this time period, pretty much right through the uh, central Finger Lakes. and. Uh, there was a site on the uh, northeast corner of, uh, Seneca, of Geneva, Seneca County, that, uh, that was discovered with some evidence. And uh, a lot of points, awls, uh, scrapers, things of that nature. And a lot of food evidence. Uh, the thing I love about archaeology is uh, once they hit a site and uh, can start sifting through, they can get right down to little fish bones. And uh, sometimes they find things that have been stored and forgotten. Um, so they came across all kinds of evidence, including uh, acorns and um, uh, tree nuts that have been forgotten about. So um, based on this evidence, uh, we do know that uh, acorns were a huge food source. And pretty much across North America, um, native people that had access to oak trees um, really relied on acorns. Um, I guess today in an infomercial on TV, they would probably call it a miracle food. Uh, they, they have carbohydrates and proteins and all of the eight essential amino acids. Um, one drawback is that uh, acorns do have a lot of tannin in them. So you have to leach them out to uh, make them less bitter. But once you've done that, um, there's all kinds of applications. You can boil them and uh, things like that. And it seems like one of the big things is uh, grinding them down to a fine flour and leaching out the tannins. And then from there, you can pretty much do anything that you do with flour, throw it in stews, make bread out of it, and uh, things of that nature. And um, likewise, you know, uh, all the other nuts and fruits of the forest. And um, based on the bone evidence, they were pretty much omnivores, all types of large and small mammals and uh, fish. So uh, the evidence shows that they were probably um, uh, net casting with uh, sinker stones and uh, the 
Finger Lakes are ideally suited for this. So you've got places like Booty's Point and Kashang and pretty much any place along the lakes where you have the, um, you've got these tributaries coming in and you've got long shallow areas out into the lake where you can get out there and uh, cast nets. Oh. And um, I thought I had a, a photo of sinker stones, but it's not coming up. Um, the the net uh, stones are just uh, attached to the bottom to weight down the net, and they're also along the uh, along the inside of the net. It was uh, baited with hooks and uh, and bait, and then once they got the fish in there, they uh, uh, they pulled them in, and of course, uh, drying was the big uh, preservation of the time. And the sites of these Lamoka period villages did find uh, large fire pits, very, very long and wide. And so they were probably uh, rig rigging up drying racks so they could dry uh, meat and fish for the, for the winter. So we're gonna time skip ahead to the, uh, to the Seneca nation, uh, roughly 1000, uh, 1000 AD. And this is a uh, 1851 map uh, by Lewis Morgan, who was an early uh, anthropologist, particularly in this area. So we can see the, uh, based on 1720 uh, Haudenosaunee territory. And I'm just going to zoom in on uh, our particular area. So uh, this was the uh, Cayuga Nation territory and then uh, the Seneca from here pretty much extending almost out to almost out to uh, Buffalo and Niagara Falls. Um, I would call their foodways uh, Lamoka 2.0, the same basic diet, but then with uh, agriculture added in. So they're still relying on um, foraging and finding uh, uh, tree fruits and tree nuts and things like that. There is evidence that they began um, more cultivation of these things. So they might uh, uh, eliminate uh, less desirable trees. So there's more room for things like oaks and butternuts and, uh, uh, the, and sugar maples and the things that they really wanted. Um, and of course, the, the large difference is that they settled in uh, villages anywhere from 35 to 50 years on the same, uh, on the same site. And as uh, the resources around that area became depleted, they kept having to go further and further for firewood and things like that. They would let their village site run down and then they would uh, move to another area, usually pretty nearby. And uh, they lived in a central location with palisades and then the, um, uh, the farm fields would be nearby. So just as I relied on uh, William Ritchie for the uh, Lamoka information, uh, this is my source for what follows. Uh, Arthur Parker, uh, a collection of his uh, bulletins that he wrote for the New York State Museum. Uh, he was a noted native archeologist and museum director, both at uh, New York State Museum and at the Rochester Museum and Science Center uh, in the early half uh, excuse me, first half of the 20th century. He passed away in 1955 near Naples, New York. Um, he was half Seneca by his father. Uh, uh, being matrilineal, uh, he didn't have birthright membership into the nation, but he was accepted later. But he did uh, grow up on the reservations with his, uh, with his grand, uh, grandfather and learned quite a bit. So if you grew up in New York State, um, you probably learned about uh, Haudenosaunee culture and the three sisters, uh, corn, squash, and beans. And I won't get into the uh, I won't get into the lore of that. But uh, there is a whole creation story about why they were uh, all grown together. But uh, they were the cornerstones of the um, uh, of the diet. So Parker went into uh, great detail. He, he wrote 
a long chapter just about uh, corn itself. So it had a lot of um, symbolism and was used in a variety of uh, ceremonies. There was the green corn festival and uh, kernels and different types of corn were used uh, at uh, different stages of the year in life, but these are just some of the, um, what we would, you know, came to be known as Indian corn, but these are just some of the, uh, some of the varieties. And he, uh, uh, he threw in all of the, um, all of the Seneca terms for it as well. And if you look at the book, which is still in print, uh, he gets into all uh, some of the language. You know, there were a lot of terms around all these uh, vegetables, uh, stating you know different phrases meaning it's um, uh, it's growing, it's blooming, it's ready to harvest, things like that. And uh, you know, towards the end, I'm going to talk specifically about um, white corn, but um, all of these were uh, uh, most of these were uh, very hard shell varieties. So it took a lot of preparation. You couldn't just eat it off the cob. Um, you had to let it dry. Um, aside from using it green, you had to let it dry and then you had to separate the hulls from the, uh, uh, from the inside. And I should say, uh, uh, you can still find recipes online. There's a number of native sites that, um, that talk about this, but um, once you actually prepared the corn, it was a, a great food because you could do everything with it. Um, you know, it could, be, it could be kept dry and just add water for corn mush. It was portable, uh, but cornbread, corn stew, corn soup. Um, it reminds me of... Uh, Forrest Gump's bro, uh, friend uh, Bubba in uh, in the movie, you know, uh, saying all the different things you can do with uh, shrimp. So uh, a lot of things you can do with with corn, um, beans, wide variety. Uh, the corn stalk bean in particular is what was probably planted with the three sisters uh, because it would uh, climb the uh, climb the vines. Uh, the vines would climb up the corn stalks. So. In addition to those uh, three vegetables working well together, uh, it was also uh, economy of space. So you could really produce quite a bit uh, in, a, in a small plot. Uh, squash and melon. Uh, and again, uh, particularly pre-contact, uh, you're pretty much uh, uh, roasting and boiling in clay pots. And then of course, post, uh, uh, post-European contact, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, metal pots, but that's pretty much it. Boiling and roasting are going to be your, you know, uh, main options. So you've got baked squash, boiled squash, and also uh, squash blossoms. Uh, I've had them fried. I've never seen them uh, boiled and uh, used as a sauce, but um, they had a wide variety here. Um, this section on greens I enjoy because I grew up, my dad always uh, ate dandelion greens in the spring when uh, they first came out uh, before uh, the flowers start to uh, pop up out. Um, and greens were very important because after the, um, uh, after the winter, these were the first green things that came along. So uh, a long winter. Uh, uh, a long, long winter of, um, you know, dried meats and, and carbohydrates. So uh, the dandelion greens in particular have vitamins and minerals like uh, vitamins A, C, and K. So my, my dad grew up during the depression before you had uh, grocery stores with frozen foods and full of greens year round. And that's why the first thing they did was uh, uh, get some greens but then all of these others were used as well. Uh, pretty much anything, including, um, uh, including burdock, which uh, a lot of people now don't think of as much, but uh, mustard greens, sorrel, uh, uh, et cetera. And uh, down here, there were, they were also used uh, as uh, uh, medicinal as well. 
Um, fruits uh, were, uh, were very big. Um, if you think about the concept of sweetness, uh, it wasn't really a thing. There was uh, maple syrup. I still have this on a auto run. Um, there, uh, uh, aside from maple syrup, you know, you pretty much had whatever was at hand in terms of sweetness, and a lot of the native uh, things were not that sweet. So, uh, crab apples, um, they were roasted in the fire or marinated in syrup and uh, made them a little more appealing. And then you had, just like with the greens, you had the seasons coming along. Um, strawberries were the first fruit of the winter, and there were strawberry festivals uh, associated with that. Uh, may apples uh, and bush berries. And then something that's beginning to make a little bit of a, a comeback, pawpaws, which are native to this area, uh, but also plums and grapes and uh, things like that. Post-European contact, uh, the uh, Europeans brought over uh, all kinds of stone fruits. So they were bringing peaches and uh, peaches and new variety of apples and things like that. And uh, those were extremely popular with the Haudenosaunee and other nations. And um, the story of Johnny Appleseed, he played his part, but also uh, the native nations, as soon as they began uh, finding these things and collecting them, they'd share them with, uh, they'd share them and trade them with other people. And it uh, began moving across the Northeast and into the Midwest. And um, there were uh, cultivations of uh, orchards over by uh, Kendaya on the east side of Seneca Lake that was known as Appletown. And uh, this was documented in 1779 by uh, General Sullivan's troops when they marched up to uh, burn everything they found. Um, uh, even, even though uh, villages moved around somewhat, they uh, did start selecting uh, concentrated, uh, they, they would select areas to start orchards that they would have to travel somewhat from their village, but it was still uh, close enough by because obviously fruit trees are uh, a time investment. They're not going to um, produce right away, but uh, it was close enough that they could get over and harvest and there was not particular ownership. Um, you know, as, as, as long as you were uh, accepted by uh, a particular nation or clan, you know, you were welcome to take what you needed from the orchards, but uh, apples and peaches were found along Seneca Lake between uh, Seneca and Cayuga Lake. And nuts remained important because uh, if everything else failed, you could always go back uh, to nuts. And uh, there's a, there's a line here that you know, the young people love to go out and gather most of the nuts, but uh, when serious business was meant, the women went out uh, in groups and uh, collected as many as they could. And you'd get about a gallon of, at least with acorns, you'd get about a gallon of nut meats to two gallons of, uh, of nuts. So uh, in addition to acorns, they were using beech nuts, black walnuts, butternuts, um, and everything else. Um, if you're like me with black walnut trees on my property now, they're just a, a big nuisance. They stain everything and uh, I'm constantly throwing them out of the way of my lawnmower. But um, uh, these, were, uh, these were very important because, um, you know, if you had a drought with the corn or whatever, you know, you still could always go back to the nuts. And I do want to say before I, uh, I'm just checking my time here. Um, we talk a lot about, uh, uh, about farm work here, uh, particularly over at uh, the Rose Hill Mansion. And we've done programs on agriculture and uh, the role of workers. And uh, traditionally, it has and still today, it kind of seems to fall down towards the uh, lower scale of society. So in uh, Rose Hill Mansion in the 1850s, it was Irish immigrants, and then uh, going on through Italian immigrants and African Americans after coming up as migrant workers. And now um, it's largely uh, Latino workers. 
Um, it was quite different with the uh, uh, Haudenosaunee and particularly the Seneca. Uh, women did the farm work, but they were seen as life givers. Uh, they had a special connection with uh, Mother Earth, but they also uh, you know, brought human life. And so they were in charge of, uh, they were in charge of the agriculture, but not only did they do the work, they also decided um, which families and which clans uh, got to work certain plots. They, um, they allocated the food, they prepared the food and in society at large, they had, um, they had, they had high status. Um, so it, it was, um, uh, one of the few cultures where farm work was not looked down upon, but it was recognized as being extremely important. And it came along with um, you know, recognition as well. So now we're gonna skip ahead to modern times because one of the things we try to do is um, Native Americans are not in the past. There are still uh, uh, Native Americans, some on reservations, uh, some not. Um, but uh, I was finding this as I was uh, researching, trying to look for uh, uh, modern foodways and uh, a renaissance of, uh, of native, uh, native foodways and cuisine. Um, one of the things that happened, particularly on the reservation in the uh, uh, second half of the 20th century was a government food distribution. It's often, associated with uh, urban welfare programs and things of that nature, but it also extended to uh, government food distribution to Indian reservations. And it was the classic uh, uh, generic labels, uh, white packaging with, uh, uh, with black printing um, called commodity foods or uh, reservation, uh, reservations referred to it as commods. Um, it was all canned and processed. There was no uh, access to uh, fresh vegetables. Uh, it wasn't terribly healthy. Um, and the native population does have a high rate of uh, diabetes and other health problems. Uh, but like anything else, uh, some have fond memories of it. Uh, you can go online, find stories. It's like, you know, they remember their uh, uh, grandmothers and mothers. Uh, uh, making delicious food out of these commodities, which all came in cans and um, government cheese and things like that. Uh, and as you can see here, one native artist uh, turned the labels into popular shirts. And um, I found at least one native blues song about commodity cheese on YouTube. So if you, um, if you, if, if you uh, plug that in, uh, uh, you might be surprised what you find, but uh, it's become part of uh, uh, part of the culture. So I mentioned health problems with processed foods. Also um, food insecurity is a big thing you hear everywhere. Again, usually in urban areas, uh, food deserts, things like that. Uh, it's also true on reservations. So uh, there are efforts to turn this around. Uh, this is the Seneca Nation Farms. Uh, I've not practiced my uh, Seneca pronunciations, so I'm not going to try, but this is located on the Allegheny and Cattaraugus reservations in the southeast corner of the state, and um, they've started providing fresh and healthier food. Um, as you can see here, they've started a bison herd, but they're also um, harvesting deer and uh, uh, raising cattle, and um, their mission statement is addressing food security and food sovereign, sovereignty through community engagement and wellness by implementing a, a Haudenosaunee approach to agricultural uh, practices. So they're trying to get people away from uh, high cholesterol, high, high carbs and high sugars. And if you go to that, um, uh, if you go to that website or just, you know, uh, uh, Google, look on Seneca Nation Farms on Facebook or Google it. Um, they have a lot of initiatives, including uh, mobile food trucks to get around to the reservation, but also I think off the reservation to uh, people who need the food.
So this was one area that I already knew about and I wanted to look more into was the uh, Iroquois, um, uh, Iroquois uh, white corn project. Um, nutritionally, it's uh, gluten-free, low in sugar, high in fiber, protein, and slow, re slow releasing carbohydrates. And like acorns has a lot of amino acids. So um, uh, it's very healthy and it's better than you know, modern varieties. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you need to uh, get the hulls off and the traditional uh, way was you uh, would, let's see, no, uh, you would braid the corn, you'd let it dry for anywhere from six months to a year, and then you had to get it off the cob. And uh, then you had to uh, boil it with a weak lye, usually hardwood ashes. So, and here's a... Uh, the image at the bottom is of the ashes. So you throw this all in a big pot, uh, boil it over the fire for quite some time. Uh, and then you had to, uh, then you had to wash it. Uh, of course, to remove the lye, but also to uh, separate the hulls from, uh, uh, from the inside. So it was very manual, you know, just have to keep rubbing it. Uh, parching is another uh, thing. Uh, Modern times, uh, coffee roasters can do the parching and you can also use culinary lime instead of uh, hardwood ashes to, uh, uh, to remove the hulls, but you still have to keep washing it. And that's the very laborious part of this. So um, this was a project that was started um, by a couple out, um, out in uh, the Allegheny Reservation. And, but then after they passed away, it was picked up by Peter Jemison and the friends of uh, Ganondagam. So they are growing their own and they're encouraging other people uh, to grow this variety of corn. This is what I was looking for. This is the picture of the, uh, of the braiding. So uh, when, when it comes in at the end of the fall, you know, people get together and they, uh, and they braid it. And at, also at the same time, you can see where some are missing. Um, they're either picking out any of the bad kernels and then they let it dry and then they can begin, uh, begin processing it. Uh, here's, a, here's a photo from, I think, uh, Minnesota maybe uh, showing the old style where they've got a, um, a big kettle with the hardwood ashes in there and, uh, and a wooden paddle. And then you have to uh, throw it on there and just keep you know, rubbing it and um, abrading it to get all, the, um, get all the hulls off. And you can see all the, all the many people who don't want to get their hands wet. Uh, this is at some kind of workshop uh, standing around. Um, and after this is done, uh, you can buy white corn flour now, but they're also trying to uh, get it back to uh, the reservations and um, it's become kind of a boutique culinary item, but also they want to encourage, um, you know, uh, native people to, you know, get this back into their diet to help, uh, you know, fight some various problems. And that was 30 minutes. Uh, it was uh, a mile wide and about an inch deep, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. So there is one question in the chat box, John. <clears throat> it says, why do we not use acorns for natural food today? And that could, to you or to the audience in general? Uh, people may be, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's one of those things we've uh, uh, gotten away from. And um, in, in doing this research and reading, and uh, if, you, if you find uh, native, uh, native websites, uh, the one for acorns was uh, called uh, Indian Country Today. Uh, there are still people that are going out and doing this. Um, you know, they tell you what time of year to, um, uh, to harvest them, how to tell if, you know, an acorn is bad before you put in all the work. And um, even so much as all different kinds of varieties of oak tree, which ones have, you know, fewer tannins than others.
We're a small enough group, so if anybody, please speak up if you have any questions or comments. Or if you have anything you'd like to share, um, share with everyone. Don't know if I have questions, but I just want to say thank you. I really enjoyed that. It is very thought provoking. <laughs> I was also wondering about the acorns. Like, is it possible that people are not using them much now? Because even once you do all the processing, they're still really kind of bitter by modern standards. Or if it's just that we people have lost interest. I maybe I'll have to try it someday. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and there's information about you know different, you know, which ones require more leaching. Um People who are into, uh, it's also a great project if you're into uh, natural dyes. Uh, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. You can uh, save, save the leach water and uh, dye your wool. And apparently it, it's kind of like a pre-preparation. And then, you know, when you go to add color to the wool, it uh, makes it much brighter. Um, but um, yeah, I think it is a little bit of, um, you know, the, the, these, are, these are all very healthy things that will, uh, that will keep you alive, and we have just kind of moved away from that. I'd be happy to have somebody come harvest my acorns. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that'll be a program next fall. Uh, Sherry. <laughs> really? <laughs> we're all, all going to come to uh, Sherry's house. Yeah, for an acorn harvesting and black walnuts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and my my neighbor will share in that too. He, we we. Yeah, we both would like to share the black walnuts. <laughs> that comment you just made about wool was interesting. Did the um, the agricultural projects of the Seneca extend to um, raising animals, or was it just crops? Um, I think it was mostly crops. Uh, I'm sure it changed towards uh, later European contact, but early on in the 1600s and early 1700s, they didn't have uh, beasts of burden. They didn't have horses. So um, that was partly why they moved villages. They didn't have um, means to go further and bring in firewood and things like that. So um, uh, yeah, no, they were um, on the hunting side, they were still uh, hunting everything that was available, um, passenger pigeons, which have, are sadly extinct, but um, they uh, uh, they were a good source of food, particularly in the spring when other animals were quite lean from uh, from the winter starvation. Uh, the passenger pigeons would be nesting, and you could uh, pretty much just knock them out of a tree. So, oh. Any more questions? Well, thank John. Thank you very much for a very informative program, and we'll let everybody else oh, let everybody else get on with their day. Thank you again for joining us. Our next sandwich in will be February sixteenth. Um, Ann Daly, our director of education, will be doing that program. And you can always go to our website, uh, historicgeneva.org, to see our latest programs, exhibits, and other activities. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah, you're welcome.